Welcome to another edition of the BNFT Chat. Today we'll be speaking to Madam Yolanda Kuba. She is the CEO of Vodafone, the second largest telecom company in Ghana. We're going in, she'll be telling us about Vodafone, what they've been doing. We're talking about the industry, some of the challenges that they face and how she thinks some of these issues should be resolved and help in building a better telecom industry in this country. My name is Novan Akohevo. Join us as we go in and speak to Yolanda Kuba. Um, MC, thank you very much for joining us on the BNFT chat uh, today. Yolanda, it's, it's our first time talking to you. I mean, I don't know I stand for correction, mm -hmm. but you seem to be the first name to be head in this organization, right? Yes, yes, I How's it been for you? It's uh, It's been great. Uh, it's been a year now, so it's. Um, I've taken time to, to settle in, but I now I feel like I'm firm, my feet are firmly on the ground. You sure you are? It grips everything. I'm so. certain that I've put everything now. I mean, in the one year, yes. what would you say has been your biggest challenge? My biggest challenge is most probably uh, the entire 4G discussion and the progress around that, which has been slower than, to be honest, what I would have wanted uh, that to be. And then obviously some of the market issues around the fragmentation in the market and things like that. That was probably has been the biggest challenge. But having said that, I think uh, for the first year we've recorded really some remarkable achievements as well. We've had uh, double digit growth in revenue. We had more than 60% growth in EBITDA, which is earnings uh, for interest and, and, and depreciation and amortization. So we've had a fantastic year. And if I look at even some of the accolades that we've received in the past year, including that for uh, the best uh, telecom uh, brand and so on, I really am proud. Uh, and in the last uh, few months, we started our digitization uh, vision around igniting Ghana's digital revolution and we've already been recognized for actually starting to make inroads in that space where we're saying we want to make make sure that no one is left behind in this digital world so a lot of progress then in that, in that respect as well okay so you talk about this 4g thing mm. which was big issue I'm sure mm. last two years mm. last year mm. when the NCA or the regulator let me put that we decided mm. to give out yeah. you know one of two licenses they mm. claim to have had, mm. yes. you know, there's left to only one. Yes. There are about mm. four or five of you mm. who don't have. Yes. yes. Was it a disappointment to you? And are you hoping that this particular one that is left will be given to a company like yours, which is the second largest, let me put mm. it, uh, telecom company in the country? So the biggest challenge is not, I wouldn't say is the regulator themselves. The biggest challenge was the price at which the the, the spectrum actually came. If it was uh, affordable, uh, to be honest, we would have acquired it as well. You know, so there's nothing wrong that MTN has done by acquiring 4G spectrum. However, from our side, we are we, we're just disappointed at the price, and and it's a price that we cannot actually meet at this point in time. We are talking to the regulator constantly and looking for alternative ways to make sure that our customers actually get to experience 4G as well. So are you thinking of probably the one that is left, you team up with another telecom company to be able to acquire it, uh, do sort of co-sharing, let me put that way? So there are a number of scenarios that we're playing with and we're talking to the regulator about it. It would be too premature to actually discuss anything outside an agreement with the regulator and other parties around us. I see. Yeah. I feel like at some point maybe the regulator will say, okay, all of you that are left share the single one that is left. Well, uh, a regulator, it's very difficult for a regulator to make that kind of determination because there are so many other core dependencies around actually operating a network. The spectrum is but one of the small elements in actually providing the telecom infrastructure. So we all have different equipment, we all have different stuff that needs to talk to each other and the technology that we use to deploy our network on is all different and you know so there's a lot of choices in this uh, in this matrix that we have to make outside the spectrum so you know there isn't like there is a wholesale kind of company that we can form and everyone will automatically be plugged into uh, simultaneously 
So there's a lot of stuff like that. Let's look at uh, technology. I mm. mean, we, we've seen many things happening to us now yeah. uh, when it comes to data, yes. especially. Mm. I mean, that's yes. we, we're told that even in terms of buying normal call uh, mm. credits mm. To, for, for our simple calls mm. that we make, mm. now everybody. Yeah, or that either doing calls on um, Facebook, yes. on WhatsApp, yes. or on any of these so-called mm. social media applications that yes. we, we talk about. How, how are you taking advantage of that to ensure that you stay in business? Because if the business mm. of simple calls is going away, mm. you still need to be able to make profit. You may have recorded mm. impressive uh, digits, yeah. but I mean, the interim <laughs> seems to be very difficult. So, I mean, there are a whole thing around OTT players, over-the-top players, which is the and so on, you know, um, pre presents a, a challenge and an opportunity. A challenge for, firstly, let me pick on the country. It's where are the profits for this voice traffic actually now being recorded? Like, what I can tell you for sure is that it's not being recorded in Ghana. It's now being recorded in the U.S. or somewhere else. So, what happens to the tax base here? is the question that we should be asking as a country, you know. So when these things happen, although it's convenient, it's all these things, we must also think about what happens to the country. So for me, that's the, that's the one of the issues that we have to look at. And then the second element that we have to look at is ourselves. The reason OTT players are actually doing what they're doing is because telco companies like ourselves have refused to innovate, you know. So we are also having a critical look at ourselves and saying, actually, how did OTT players become relevant? How, how is it? Because we had SMS. Remember SMS? Yes. Yeah. You know, we had that, maximum numbers that we could, you know, could put. You could, you could put on a text. Yeah. You, we had limited number of uh, pictures that you could send yes. at a time. You, had, you couldn't create groups. Yeah. Oh, so what do you think then happens to when, when someone else actually innovates and provides that? You go to that person. So it is a lack of innovation that has created this problem. It, it's, it's nothing more than that. So for us as telcos, we now are sitting back and saying, guys, it is lack of innovation from our part that, have, uh, that has created the competition. The same with the banks, the same as with everyone else. It's lack of innovation, to be honest, or lack of customer service, or lack of something that the customer really need that is creating the opportunity uh, that is actually happening there. So when I look at it, then I'm like, okay, guys, so what does it mean the next opportunity for us is? You know, there will come a time, I mean, uh, where voice will cost you almost nothing. You know, I mean, if I look at the price that you pay for voice today on, on GSM, on our network, and, I, and the number of minutes you've got 10 years ago relative to now, is that, the why, is that the reason why I now buy a simple uh, call card and two other people can recharge? Isn't the same? Thing? No, no, no. That one is that one is an innovative way to engage with our customers and actually give value to our customers right. as Vodafone. So there, that's us trying to be innovative. Innovative, right? Okay. okay. Around something, around how we engage with our customers and how how we give value to our customers. Giving back to them. Yes, you know. So, so for me, it's that whole hodgepodge of stuff that we need to actually deal with. So there are some challenges, but as I'm saying, there are also some opportunities around, around, uh, around the OTT players, the over the top players, actually coming into the market. I mean, you, what we find in more and more of, there are also opportunities to partner well with OTT players now. You know. Three years ago, it wasn't so obvious, but now there are real opportunities around partnership with OTT. Which players. are the ones that you taking advantage to make sure that you can keep your customers to you? Because if you're saying that lack of innovation, mm. then what are the innovations that you are putting on the table to keep you in business? So the the first thing is I'll give you an example. You find in other markets, for example, uh, MNOs allow Wi-Fi calling, for example, you know, on their own network. The, only, the difference now between Wi-Fi calling on on what's this, on your GSM sort of Vodafone type thing and uh, and uh, Skype call or whatever would be that on my Voda, on on your Vodafone it's actually carrier grade. When we call when we talk about carrier grade, it means that we actually make sure that the entire network actually operates at a level at which uh, your GSM should operate at. Sometimes, for example, when you are on some of the OTT uh, kind of calls. You can hear that you've got some interference. 
which you don't actually have in, uh, in, 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 in a career grade kind of uh, solution. So there are things that we're doing where we actually say we allow our customers to actually do this. We shouldn't be actually saying things like we allow our customers to do it. We should be saying that it is the right of our customers to actually do whatever they want so. on the network. So just that change in mindset, because all our models have been around, I, I, give, I allow you 10 minutes of talk time. I allow you five gigs of data. You know, <laughs> At some point, the customer is like, I'm tired of this thing, guys. You know, <laughs> or, uh, I need to choose, not you choose for me. So, I mean, there's a lot of thinking around that. There's a lot of work that we're doing with the technology team around just saying, if you're saying, if we're true to saying we're putting the customer first, what does that really mean? It means maybe the customer should choose their own package. Let me just then For ask, example. Okay, so let me then ask you as mm. we, we roll out to the end of the year, because mm. half of it mm. is gone, mm. the tech quarter is almost mm. gone. Mm. What are the things you have under your sleeve for the red customers? Let me put that way. Well, the red customers, hey, yes. hey you're obviously on, board of, on, on our red package. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much for your for your support. Uh, no, we've done, <laughs> we've done, we've, we, we, we actually have lots of stuff over, uh, on our sleeves. Uh, uh, if you think about the, from the beginning of this year, how many stuff that we've really done, uh, and I'll mention one or two that are really big. We've done what we called uh, super care, which was for, the, for people with, uh, with hearing impairment and uh, who are also not able to speak. And we actually came up with the package specifically for them. So today, when you go to our call center, we actually are able to service them. We are able to. We have people that can sign, can talk to them via video calling to support them. Because before this, in Ghana, there was no one who could support those people. Well, Zero. Some of them mobile phones. They own mobile phones. They communicate via their mobile phone. And we actually then came up with the package because we didn't stop just at saying how do we support them in terms of just call center and what they require, but also how do we make sure that they're confidently connected every day. So we actually deeply discounted the packages that they have so that we make sure like as easy as it is for you to talk, it must be just as easy for them to actually get onto a data package. You know? So we have, daily, we have daily, weekly, monthly packages for them that are deeply, deeply, deeply subsidized. You know, and for me, that's important because that is their lifeline. That is their, that's their communication to the world. That's their window to the world. So we needed to make sure that we are relevant to, to, to that group of people. So, I mean, that's one. Vim was another one that we did, which is Vision in Motion, which is for the youth. And basically, it was, it was to address a specific issue around underemployment in Ghana and also unemployment. And basically, that was around giving skills. So by someone actually getting the Vim package, they get videos that teach them how to do specific kind of skills uh, or crafts. And then after so many um, videos that they've watched, then we actually get them into a certification program and also do trade fairs so that they are able to actually up their craft. So it could have been anything from t-shirt screen making to catering to uh, hairdressing to so juice making and all those kind of things. And those skills are skills that we actually went out and asked people, what are the primary skills that you would want to have as someone who is underemployed today in Ghana or someone who's unemployed? And that can help you in the future. So we've done all those kind of stuff and we deliver that as part of the value proposition. So when you pay your three CDs on them, your weekly three CDs, these are the kind of stuff. That it doesn't you look like yes. those are the packages from other companies where you have paid three CDs. If, mm. if they tell you giving you one gig, mm. maybe after two days the one gig is exhausted and that's it. No, this this is specific because the videos that we actually provide you are actually free. You know, so those are zero rated to you. So, I mean, so we've done those kind of stuff in order to up the skill to say, you have your phone, so how do we use the phone that you love so much? to actually be of value to Ghana as Vodafone. And that's really the, the, the challenge that we took on. And we actually did that. And then we actually have other packages. We have Vodafone Black, which is for our ultra high value customers, uh, as well basically where it's a super service kind of thing, where they've got uh, the ability to personalize their network. So instead of seeing Vodafone, you can see Yolanda Tuba as my, my network. Or if you think you are really cool, you could be like, 
Shata or, oh, or if you were like a proper reggae stone boy, you can pull, but you can pull your network whatever you want. So you, you can, for a price, you can actually personalize your network, you can actually choose your own number, you, you actually uh, pay a certain amount as long as you are actually on, on the network uh, for a period of time and you actually qualify through some qualification criteria that we've got. You are entitled to it, and you have a personalized agent. Never have to call the call center, and all those kind of things. So I mean, it's a. Uh, so we've done a number of things, and then the one that you mentioned earlier, Ekikimi, which is our promotion, which is uh, like you know, uh, buy one scratch card and actually share it amongst three people, you and two friends, uh, and people are loving it. Uh, so yeah. Okay, now let's talk about I mean, because mm. you talk about giving back mm. to mm. the society, mm. the corporate social responsibility mm. as they see yes. uh, SR yes. or as, 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 as it is. Yes. As a company, mm. do you feel that you've given back enough? Having been here for so many years, we remember mm. Ghana Telecom moved to become a different name. I mean, <laughs> we, we've seen telecom companies always <laughs> <term of force, laughs> changing their names. Mm. And so, I mean, for so many years that you've been here, mm -hmm. and uh, the huge numbers, you enjoyed number two mm -hmm. on the market. Yes. Do you think, from where you sit, you give your feedback enough mm -hmm. to, to the community or so, to help, you know, so build I, the society you are in? If I look at in terms of why I wake up in the morning, okay, which is to see someone be, uh, someone being able to communicate with the people they love or the people they need. To actually communicate with, you know, um, I'm actually quite comfortable that we are we we are doing enough. You know what we've done as a as a as a company, we've been able to democratize the whole notion of communication. People used to communicate once a week or once a month with their loved one. You know, there was one family with a phone in the village, and everyone used to use that phone once and call their loved ones. What have we done by building out the network that we've built it now is that everyone now can communicate every day. Every day. So today you can call your love line like 20 times a day if you want. And WhatsApp them 100 times if you want. You know, whereas like 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 20 years ago it was a dream. You, you, I mean, if I told you that you'd be able to talk to your loved one every day in the village to your grandmother and whatever, you'd, you'd be like impossible. Yeah, okay. queue. You have to queue, you have to go to the family, ask for permission to come and use the phone, someone needs to call you from your house and so on and so on. We used to go and stand by um, um, the post office, mm. you know, those phone booths, yes. you queue, yes. they tell you to call at 1 o'clock, yes. so that 1 o'clock exactly. you're there, you so, drink but, but that but you just do? imagine how, how we've revolutionized communication and in addition to that we just didn't actually build the infrastructure. We also actually made sure that the communication is democratized through how we charge for it, you know, because the charging actually is what actually makes this so easy to use. Because today you have bundles that are as low, you, at some point you have 50 pesos, uh, one, one, one CD. CD. So for change in your pocket, now you actually created value from it for people to communicate. There are very few services that actually allow that to happen. So we actually made sure that the micro payments are acceptable as a form of exchange between us and our customers. Because, I mean, if you think about it, even GT when it, when it started with mobile, you know, you had to queue, you, uh, you were paying a million for a SIM card oh and all those kind of things. And, you know, I mean, just think of how we've come. But, and that's the point, is that these are all deliberate ways in which we, the telco industry has actually democratized communication. And it has changed everything. Now you don't have to actually wait in a specific location and wait for a landline to, to phone. And you know, I, I'll talk about myself. When I was a little young girl, you know, you waited for the boyfriend to call you and you kept on looking at the phone for hours, you know, and you couldn't go and play because you were scared that someone's gonna call. You know, and I can imagine if you were, you were working at that time, you were worried that your boss was gonna call and you actually sat there the whole day. Now you can go about your own life and do other things from a productivity perspective while you're waiting for the sport to actually happen in your hands. So there's a lot of things that have happened. So then moving then specifically then to CSR, I mean, if I look at uh, Vodafone, I'll talk from 2009, something like um, the health, health, the health line TV. 
you know, I mean, that has absolutely impacted so many people's lives. We actually have homecoming. You know, Ghana has this unique kind of thing where people cannot leave without paying their bills from the hospital. Okay, and we keep those people in hospital. Um, and those some of those people have not have not uh, left with their home, their hospital for a year, for an entire year. So we go there and we pay for them to go and be with their loved ones, for example. So we have instant schools where we actually provide anyone in Ghana, anyone, when I say anyone, whether you're on Vodafone or not, access to a platform where you can have educational content for, for schooling. And also what is, we're now adding on is actually the ability to learn coding on that platform. And if you're a Vodafone customer, the difference is you can access that platform without paying for the data that you're using. But if you are another uh, MNO kind of customer, then you pay that MNO for, 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 for that price. But for us, it is all around this idea that we want to make sure we ignite Ghana's digital revolution to make sure that we're actually pushing the envelope. Because we do believe that Ghana can be the digital hub for West Africa. We've got the skills, we've got the people, we just need to invest in so there's a lot of stuff that we've done around CSI. We've, we've uh, invested a lot in STEM. We've invested a lot in girl, uh, girl child education around, around STEM to try and increase the, the, the number of women and girls that are actually in, uh, in, 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 in STEM and engineering and those kind of courses as well. So yeah, there's a lot of stuff that we've done. So have we done enough? I think the need will always be bigger. The need will always be bigger. But have we made an impact? And I believe we have. Moving to the area of um, mobile money. Yes. Do you think that your mobile money business mm. is doing well? Vodakash, mm. you call it. Yes. Would you say you're doing well? So I think, I mean, we are the last kids on the block on, on mobile money. And when we started, we started in August about uh, two years ago now. Um, and it's been a phenomenal growth story. We have more than a million customers today that are on on uh, on mobile money, and and therefore for us it is uh, it's 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 success to be honest. We're seeing growth in in excess of 30, 40 percent in in the customer base year on year. So for us, it's really really encouraging the kind of results that we've seen. And if we look at the absolute numbers and uh, competition, actually having cognizance of that, uh, there were parties that came long before us uh, in the mobile money space, uh, and us having overtaken them now, uh, I think we've, we're actually doing quite well. You're doing quite well. Yeah. And um, we understand that some telecos have made moves mm. um, to want to get banking license. Mm. I mean, already you seem to be a threat Mm. to the banks in this mm. country. The business of mobile money mm. seems to be a threat enough. Mm. And now you have mobile companies thinking that we also want to venture into the full business of banking. Mm. From where you sit, mm. should, you, should that be your core business? Should you be thinking about that? Mm. Should you be working hand in hand? So for me, uh, I mean, the whole issue around being a bank is a, is a non-issue at all. I do not want to be a bank. I'm very clear about that. But I exist to be complementary to a bank. Okay? The only reason that uh, mobile companies will actually go into a, a to acquire a mobile uh, um, a banking license is because the cooperation between the bank and the mobile money uh, industry is not there. That's the reason. So remember, the only reason mobile money exists, as I said, that we have a trade as a, as a telco with OTT, because of lack of innovation. This is the same lack of innovation from the banking sector that's actually created a new industry to move money. Because, I mean, it was the bank's business to move money, whatever the, uh, the kind of platforms they would choose to use. They chose only to use branches, you know, physical hard infrastructure. And the telcos actually understanding that partnerships are important, remember, the, the, the agents are our partners. There are 80,000 agents that are out there that are our partners. A bank cannot match that informal kind of distribution today. So it, it, what mobile money does, it brings banking closer to the people. 
financial inclusion financial inclusion that's what it is it is financial inclusion basically my view is that the 70 percent of the population that is today financially excluded and our role as uh, as mobile operators is to facilitate the inclusion of that 70 percent for hundreds of years the banking industry has been around and they've only managed to include 30 percent and what I know for sure is that as a banking industry, like we've done it with uh, communication, uh, as a telco industry, we can include most of that 70% into the formal kind of uh, financial system. And not, it's not just banking, it's financial system. It's the ability to do insurance and, and be able to get paid when something wrong actually happens. It's ability to actually do micropayments to each other. It's ability to actually make sure that your business grow by actually being able to monitor day by day how much you make instead of putting your money under a mattress. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of benefit that we actually are able to deliver to, to our customers as a result of having mobile money. So you're saying that until the banks begin to innovate, they might push some telcos to want to venture into the business of banking. There, I mean, that goes without saying. You know, uh, but for me, the model is around partnership. That's me as Vodafone at this stage. Mine is to partner with banks in order to deliver financial inclusion. I have no intention of having to comply with Basel two, Basel three. that is still going to come, capital adequacy, making sure that my capital ratios are fine, and all those things. I have zero intention of having, including that in our business model. Maybe there is a telco that is willing to actually have that, but we are not one of those. But would you say people. that the regulator, that is BOG, Bank of Ghana, mm -hmm. and your regulator, mm -hmm. that's the National Communications mm -hmm. Authority, mm -hmm. should they even allow that? Because just as you said, complement each other, mm -hmm. partnership, mm -hmm. let's help mm -hmm. you know, ensure that we have the financial inclusion that we are looking at. Mm -hmm. Should they allow even for that? So the, the regulator's uh, role is to be a facilitator. So if you're a facilitator, you should allow it. Whether it, you should do it or not is, is, a, is, a, is a secondary question. So if you ask me, the regulator, should the regulator allow for it to happen? I would say yes, because it facilitates innovation as well. You know, I mean, remember, the scope of what we allow allows us to play with different pieces of the puzzle in order to create the kind of value that we want to create in the economy. A restrictive regulation environment doesn't allow for that. So I'll give you an example. If our, our spectrum, for example, that we, we've bought over the years, our 2G and 3G spectrum, actually allowed for, for uh, what we call a, a universal license or the ability to actually use any technology on the spectrum that you have, we would have 4G today. Because the constraint is not, is, is, is not uh, that we don't have the spectrum, per se. The constraint is that the spectrum that we have only allows you to only use a specific kind of technology. So, and I'll give you an example in South Africa. In South Africa, South Africa hasn't actually had an option on, on what we would call 4G spectrum here. They're still using the old 2G and 3G spectrum, but the 4G penetration in South Africa is almost like 40 or 50%. They haven't had an increase in the amount of spectrum that they have. And it's not only in South Africa, it's other countries as well that have gone the same route. So it's, it's different things. So it allows that innovation, it allows that growth, because regulation can never be the, the, the bottleneck, the constraining factor for, for growth and innovation. You know? So the more liberal the, the, the regulation, the easier it is to create value by the players in, in, in the private sector. I mean, let's look at the future of the industry that you work in. Do you mm. think that we have a future? You know, some have even said that, listen, I mean, with a country's uh, population, 28 million, mm. I guess, mm. uh, around that figure, mm. <laughs> having about five or six telecos is even too much. Yes, I agree with that. And that's the fragmentation I was talking to about uh, earlier on. I think there are far too many telcos in the country for the number of people that are in the country. So if the regulator said, okay, Vodafone, pack bag and baggage and leave, we want to bring the numbers down and they want to close you down. So it would be sad if they actually started choosing 
okay. will actually close it. However, they can create an, an enabling environment for consolidation to happen. You know, because remember, the decisions must be that of the private sector. Their job is to provide the enabling environment that allows these things to actually happen easily. The leader in data services in this country in the next five years. Full stop. That's all you want to do? We will be the Because every time you talk in five years' time, nine out of ten times you'll be talking over what we call a data packet. And a data packet is, for, for example, today you talk through, uh, as you said, WhatsApp or Facebook or whatever. You know, remember, it still needs our infrastructure to operate because it's data. So I provide the data connectivity that you actually have. So I will be the backbone for data. So today I do not lead in, in, in voice. So I want to be an able challenger in voice, a really strong challenger to the incumbent on voice. And then on data, I really want to lead in data. I want Ghana to feel like Vodafone is the partner that they can legitimately have. So you would have seen, when I say data, I'm not only talking about mobile, I'm also talking about fixed. So you would have seen the, there's a lot of digging that's happening on, on fiber to the home, for example. Because in order to actually make sure that you have the best data quality, I have to increase the amount, I'll call it pipes, that I actually put into your, the, into your home. I need to make sure when we actually do the data over the air that we've got enough backhaul and enough capacity so that you can get the faster speeds. Because I can put in a tower here, if the capacity that I'm putting on there is not enough, it will still be constraining. So think of it as you, when you open the water and you've got a pipe, the thinner the pipe, the slower the water comes out. The bigger the pipe, the faster the water actually comes out. That's the same thing I need to be able to do for you in order to get the best service. And in addition to that, we'll make sure that the services that we put on top of our, of our data service is appropriate for our customers in the areas where we choose to play. You talk about pipes and it brings mm. to mind cable thefts in this yes. country. One of the challenges that you tell us have raised every now and then. Your yes. chamber is always yes. the chamber which you are the president, right? Chairman, yes. Chairman, okay. We call mm. that chairman mm. or chairperson. Mm. I mean, you, you've you always raised the issue of mm. cable thefts, you know. Yeah. How is that going? How are you able to deal with this? Because mm. I'm thinking that you do more pipes in a country where construction work mm. is an afterthought mm. where we don't come and tell you that okay we want to construct a road here and so let's check do you have pipes there mm. how do we go about it mm. oh, okay we may want to lay a pipe here so mm. let's add it to the plan mm. how, is, how is the fight against that working beyond the fact that people are stealing mm. these cables that you have mm. constructors contractors yes. are also cutting them every now and then and i see it yes. on most of the roads that are being constructed yes so, I mean, I think for us, I mean, we've gone a long way with government in trying to actually make sure that we protect the assets that we put on the ground. Um, actually, by making it uh, a necessary service or essential service and, and having those discussions, just like electricity and water and stuff like that, just saying these are essential services across, across the board. So there's some progress on that. However, it's still not where I would like it to be because data will be the lifeline of any kind of uh, environment. So we need to protect the ability to have 100% uh, uh, connectivity uptime all the time on, 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 on our cables. So is it a painful process? Yes, it's still a painful process. We have fiber cuts. You know, um, fiber you cannot sell because it's just glass. Okay? So people just break it when they're busy like digging and things like that. So we do have uh, fiber cuts. And on copper, we still have copper th uh, theft actually still happening. Because remember, we built our entire infrastructure on copper for the longest time. So we still have copper in the ground. However, um, we actually have partnered with government again to make sure that the export of copper, we actually ex uh, inspect a lot of the export of copper outside, going outside the country and basically limiting the market that is able to actually, where you're able to sell that copper to. And that, that almost curtailing of the market has actually slowed down the, the, the copper theft in the last year and a half, last 18 months. However, I mean, I still spend a heck of a lot of money on making sure that we, we don't have uh, copper theft. I've got security guards actually looking 
driving around and looking after our, our copper. I've got police actually dedicated uh, in other areas to our copper theft issues. You know, and unfortunately, people know where to where to dig. I and that and that is something that unfortunately I can do nothing about. You know, uh, but yeah, there's been progress. There's been progress. There's been progress. Okay, great. I mean. Um... Let's look at just two things and then we'll bring this uh, interview to an end. First, you're a woman mm. and I'm sure that you have been able to occupy this seat mm. gives hope to a lot of young women mm. within the organization and outside the organization to think that, okay, mm. yes, I can also make it here. So what message would you want to give to these young leaders, especially those in your organization who are working hard, breaking their back, mm. thinking that I can also get there someday. I think the, the most important thing is the I can do it kind of attitude. You know? So for me, I mean, being in this seat, the biggest message I can, I can tell you is the glass is already shattered, guys. You know, all you have to do is walk through now. You know? So it's your own work, it's your own dedication, it's your own competence that will get you there. So I want you to actually work extra hard. And when someone tells you that it's impossible to get there, tell them it's impossible for you, not for me. You know, because once the glass is shattered, guys, it's shattered. I mean, you can't pick up the glass and put the pieces back together and think you're gonna have the perfect thing. Sorry, guys out there. Sorry, guys out there. But we are here to stay. Women are 51% of the population. We will be 51% of the leadership positions in politics and business and everywhere else. It might take us a little while, but we'll get there. Wow. I see. Cost of operation. Mm. Final one. Mm. I mean, he got, he got me mm. to forget that question, but mm. I, I forgot. Cost of operation. Even though we've seen um, power stabilize yes. some way, somehow, let me put it that mm. way. Cost of operation uh, for mm. you in terms of energy. Mm. What would you say? Is this too is this still expensive for you to be able to maintain these cell sites and also have all your offices running? Is it affecting the bottom line? Let me put it that way. Absolutely, always. I mean, if we think about it, what happened last year is that we had an effective interest of uh, increase in pricing of power of about seventy odd percent. So when you have power, which is one of the lifeblood of a network, okay, increasing by around seventy percent, it impacts your it impacts your, your cost base. So it did impact our cost base in a significant way. Um, however, we can't cry about that now. You know? One of the things that was, however, unfortunate is that because of the power outages, we had to invest in uh, generators, in new generators and so on and so on. Those generators, you can't let them be idle when the power is restored. So now we actually are forced to actually also use those generators which consume diesel and so on and so on. So the cost overall of operating, cost to serve, actually has increased somewhat because I have to use, I keep on having to switch to generators to make sure that the generators are, are, not, uh, are not standing idle. So that once there's power outages, it actually works. You know, there's no point in keeping it and then there's a power outage and the generators don't work. So you keep on having to actually work with it. But the other trades around it is that the money that I use on generators, as a company, the money that we use, we could have used on network sets to connect more people and instead I had to use it to buy generators and for me that's that's really a travesty you know I want to use all the money that I get given every year to actually build the next uh, cell site to connect more people for me the more we actually connect the country the better the outcome is for the economy of this country so that's what I'm interested in and Igniting Ghana's Digital Revolution is about connecting everyone, remember? It's about leaving no one behind. So for us in a digital world, we're saying we don't want to leave anyone behind. Whether it's financial, whether it's around connectivity, whether it's around business skills, whether it's around coding, we want to teach every child in Ghana to code. That's our ambition. We want every youth in Ghana to actually have a capable skill that they are working with in order to, to better their lives. So those kind of things for us are really important around this whole digitization agenda that we have. All right. Thank you very much, Yolanda, for your time. Thank you. Grateful. Thank you. All right. Thank All right. So that's how we end today's edition of the BNFT channel with me, Norman Akwaifo. This production is brought to you by BFTonline.com. You can always visit our Facebook page that is 
the BFT Facebook page or go to our YouTube channel and get this video. And also remember, the full transcription of this interview will be in the newspaper. That is the Business and Financial Times, your Africa's leading business paper in the country. Goodbye.